and some steps towards trying to trying to avoid those uh, those harms and to to approach AI development responsibly. Uh, just a little bit of background about myself. Uh, so I have a PhD in mathematics and I worked as a uh, quant and a software engineer at several tech startups. Um, then kind of returned. I love teaching. Ended up at the University of San Francisco as faculty. And five years ago, together with Jeremy Howard, co-founded Fast AI. I'll speak a little bit about our work in a moment. Um, and then about three years ago, started a Center for Applied Data Ethics at the University of San Francisco. Uh, but since then, I have moved to Brisbane permanently, which I'm uh, really excited about. Uh, <laughs> I'm yeah, happy to be here. My partner is from Victoria, and his lifelong dream was to live in Queensland. And we have we have achieved the dream. Um, and he <laughs> spent years convincing me, but we really uh, think this is, uh, and it's it's definitely clear like this is going to be such a great place to to raise our daughter. Um, but I, I just share this because I always get a lot of questions about, about if we're going back. Um, so first, AI holds holds a lot of opportunity. And so um, I saw this uh, kind of several years ago as I was getting into machine learning and in particular deep learning, uh, like, wow, this is a really transformative technology that was kind of uh, achieving state of the art on a variety of problems. And this is, this is why Jeremy and I chose to start Fast AI uh, in 2016. And I had seen a lot of the obstacles to getting involved with, with AI. Um, and, and a lot of these still exist, although it's getting better, but kind of, you know, assuming that people have this kind of graduate and very advanced technical background, not publishing practical info and kind of overemphasizing the theoretical. Um, also, kind of when you do have practical stuff, uh, many, uh, many tutorials were just kind of doing these toy problems and giving you kind of okay results and things that wouldn't really cut it in the workplace. Um, and so we really wanted to make state-of-the-art deep learning more accessible to a much, uh, much more diverse and varied group of people from different domains, people with small data sets, with little computational power. Um, and I know, I know that the, the meetup here has gone through the Fast AI course. I won't talk about it too much, uh, but we do have a, a course, Practical Deep Learning for Coders, that's available completely for free. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few students, uh, and, and most of our students are working professionals who are already kind of high achieving people uh, looking to kind of learn a new skill set or in some cases change careers. Uh, one alum is Elena Harley, um, and she does a lot of work on um, uh, cancer and genomics and applying deep learning to, to cancer treatments. Um, and she's written some great posts um, where she really kind of beat the state of the art on many problems. Here is one looking at uh, tumor variants. Uh, she's also done work on for metastasized cancer, identifying the uh, uh, origin of the cancer, because that's an important question for treatment. Um, and so here she's talking about something where she uh, kind of Im improved from uh, kind of initially having a false positive rate of 28% and then kind of using deep learning in the fast AI library uh, to reduce that down to 4%. Um, and I talk about her and a few other, a few other students in this, uh, this post. Uh, one I, I love to share about is Corey Spencer and he's a Canadian dairy farmer. And he, he used deep learning to identify goat udder infections earlier. And so udder infections are this huge issue in the dairy industry. Uh, and often before people realize that the goats have infections, they've done irreparable damage. Uh, but basically by taking kind of these heat maps or kind of using sensors to, to see the hot spots on the udders, he could uh, identify the infection sooner and treat them. And so this was kind of a huge success. It kind of spun this off into a company. And I really love this example because this is a problem I never ever would have thought of and I didn't know anything about um, and to me highlights the value of getting people from different areas understanding deep learning and able to use it on the problems that they know about. And then a, a third alum that I um, so uh, so amazed by is Helena Sarin um, and she is an artist uh, she, you can find her work on Twitter and actually I think most social media at Neural Bricolage. Um, she's doing really, uh, really innovative work and she 
creates all the art for her training sets. So she's doing the pastels and the photography and the painting to make her training set. And then she is writing all the code for her neural networks that she trains on them. Um, and so she's doing really, really innovative things. Um, there's a great uh, article about her work by Jason Bailey. Um, so I would encourage you to check her out. Um, and I also love that she's very upfront about how she uses small data sets and small, uh, small GANs for her work. Uh, and so uh, kind of we, we were able to put our ideas to the test of like, can you really do much with a kind of small, smaller resources? Um, a few years ago, there was a competition hosted by Stanford called Dawn Bench, and it was a speed test for ImageNet. And so the idea was to achieve a certain accuracy on ImageNet, uh, the fastest um, and the cheapest for kind of two categories. And so in April 2018, when this occurred, the Fast AI team and they were going up against, I should say, teams from Google and Intel that had way, way more resources. Um, Fast AI had the lowest actual cost. They were the fastest on GPUs, fastest on a single machine, fastest on publicly available infrastructure, and faster than Intel's entry that used 128 machines. Um, and so I just think this is fantastic. Um, and they did a lot of, uh, actually, a lot of things that. Um, totally makes sense in hindsight, but we're super innovative at the time, such as starting with uh, lower res versions of the pictures, training the network to kind of get in the right range, and then switching to higher res versions. Um, and teams at Google and Intel ended up adapting these, these techniques after the competition. Um, so super proud of that. And then at the time of the competition, the, the entry that beat us was Google's entry on TPUs. Uh, and TPUs were not even publicly available back then. However, a few months later, FastAI came back and re released results 40% faster than the, the TPU results. Um, so super, super proud of the team that worked on this, um, kind of really kind of putting these ideas to the test that you can, you can do state-of-the-art deep learning with limited resources. Um, and this was covered by uh, The Verge and the MIT Tech Review. And Jeremy wrote some great blog posts kind of detailing the exact techniques that we used. Um, so hopefully all this goes to show that AI holds, holds a lot of promise. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of potential here and a lot of power. Um, but there's also the question of what, uh, what can go wrong? Uh, so I'm going to talk about, about a few things that can go wrong. Uh, one is unjust bias. Um, and so I'm not talking about the bias in the statistical sense, but um, kind of a, a, a unjust bias, um, sociological bias. And so we see examples and things. Um, this was a paper in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences looking at uh, lung x-rays. Um, and this was interesting. And if you use a really gender imbalanced data set for, for lung x-rays, you get worse performance on uh, the gender that you did not include in your data set, which uh, makes sense. And so if you have, you know, the X-ray is seventy-five percent from men and only twenty-five percent from women. The you know the classifier that you train, and this is you know for identifying lung cancer um, or other uh, thoracic issues, is going to do worse on women um, and vice versa. Uh, so bias can show up. Uh, we also see this in there's a uh, program used by police in uh, New South Wales that has an algorithmic component, and it was found that it was disproportionately targeting Indigenous youth. Um, so it kind of had this uh, uh, racial and ethnic component um, that was leading police to kind of disproportionately harass Indigenous youth. And there have been a lot of similar examples um, in the U.S. and other countries with these sorts of programs. Uh, we also see... Actually, I guess this is not exactly, uh, uh, well, this is, this is bias, I mean, this is anti-Semitism, but Facebook over the years has had a number, a number of issues in how it lets advertisers target groups. So for a while, it was letting advertisers reach uh, this category, quote, Jew haters, uh, which is incredibly anti-Semitic um, to allow this. Um, it's also uh, repeatedly, even after people have pointed it out, to let people place housing ads that exclude, exclude users based on race. Uh, placing job ads that exclude older workers or exclude um, women. Um, so a lot of kind of discriminatory behavior is possible with uh, advertising. And it's not just Facebook. There are a lot of issue, issues with um, Google ads as well and Google, Google search uh, giving you know, different results or biased results. Um, 
I do want to highlight uh, two uh, relevant projects here. Um, and so one is the Australian Ad Observatory, and this just launched last week. This is a citizen science project, um, and it's um, in part from professors at QUT, as well as M M Monash and other universities in Australia. And this is Australia specific. Um, and this is through the Automated Decision Making in Society uh, ARC Center of Excellence, which has a node um, here at QUT. Um, so check this out if you want to help. It's kind of a browser pl plug in to just even try to uh, gather data on how people are seeing different ads on, on Facebook. I um, mean, there was a good kind of article in the conversation about it uh, that the, the researchers wrote about the project. Um, and then there's another project also from ADMS on uh, similarly on search algorithms and the search algorithms is it, um, to include kind of looking at the election because uh, it'll be running during that time um, so you can kind of check those out because one of one of the issues is also just even uh, you know the opacity of these platforms of kind of not knowing what ads they are serving to who or how how this works and the personalization of search and kind of who who is seeing what okay so that's issue one is uh, is bias so i'm going through the perils uh, Another issue is feedback loops, um, and feedback loops occur when your system is uh, kind of influencing what the next round of data is going to look like, and so you can kind of end with this uh, self-reinforcing process. And we've seen a lot of feedback loops uh, with recommendation systems, um, so that includes YouTube, uh, when it auto-plays the next video for you, um, that's a recommendation. So is, you know, the order that uh, Twitter or Facebook puts your timeline in. Um, and so that's led to that's led to a lot of radicalization of kind of um, showing people that might not have otherwise come across um, uh, anti science conspiracy theories or um, kind of hate speech or kind of hate based uh, conspiracy theories or material. Uh, a lot of people are being exposed to this uh, and, and potentially radicalized. I included this uh, this headline: a mass murder of and for the internet, which was about the, the mass shooting in New Zealand at two mosques a few years ago, and social media really played a role in that. And the shooter was somebody who was very active on social media, um, including about the about the shooting. Um, so that's kind of a, an example of these of these feedback loops. And then a, a third a third issue that I want to emphasize this is an answer to my question of what can what can go wrong and that's that when errors happen they can happen at a, uh, at a much larger scale um, and so we see that with examples like robo debt and robo debt did not involve ai but it was an automated system and kind of the same mechanism is present with ai where when there is an error that error can be happening at a much larger scale uh, than it would with with people um, we also see that very tragically uh, with the, the genocide in Myanmar, which the, the UN found Facebook had played a determining role, and I'll talk more about this later, but Facebook uh, execs had been warned for years uh, that this was escalating and about the way the platform was being used to incite violence um, and failed to take, uh, take much action about it. And again, that was kind of happening at a huge scale. You had a country that came online very quickly um, and uh, a lot of things kind of being shared uh, very broadly, promoting, uh, you know, dehumanizing hate speech and, and eventually genocide. Um, yeah, and so I found, um, I kind of found these uh, problems so captivating that kind of over the past few years, they were more and more, this was kind of all, all I could think about. And so I ended up, um, uh, pivoting from, from being mostly focused on fast AI to, to starting a center for applied data ethics at the University of San Francisco to really um, try to focus on, on these issues uh, because they are, I think, so, so urgent and are impacting people now and, and harming real people. Um, and this is something that's, I should also say, the, uh, these values have been woven into fast AI from the start of including including education about ethics and, and I'll talk about this more later, but also the role of diversity and getting people from other backgrounds towards trying to uh, address and mitigate these, these ethics issues. So here I want to um, I want to address a question that I hear I get a lot of variations on this, um, which is kind of why the fuss about algorithmic harms, you know, so the things I mentioned, you know, I talked about bias, but humans are biased too. you know, there's tons of research showing kind of how biased humans are. Um, and I've talked about errors, but humans make errors too. So why, uh, why am I focused on algorithmic harms? Why is this something to particularly uh, to worry about? 
And there are a few reasons. One is that machine learning can amplify bias. Um, so it's not just encoding already existing biases. And there's several studies that have shown this. Um, this one is one that looked at uh, kind of job descriptions on LinkedIn. And it found that in data sets that were already imbalanced, so for instance, surgeons kind of in their data set, um, only 14% of the surgeons in their data set were women. Uh, but the classifier they trained only had 11% uh, women in the true positives. Um, and kind of basically there's this uh, asymmetry where it's kind of safer for the algorithm to guess uh, that a surgeon's a man. Um, and so they found this compounding effect around bias. Um, this has been shown in kind of other, uh, uh, other data sets and other uh, algorithms as well. Um, so this is, this is a risk of amplification. Um, I mentioned before feedback loops and kind of the role uh, that feedback loops play. And so to, to be more explicit, you know, a feedback loop occurs when your model is uh, controlling the next round of data that you get. Um, and so I think this is, it's a little bit hard because, you know, we, uh, I've totally, I've had jobs with the title data scientist. And so we're thinking of this model of kind of like, oh, a scientist is someone that like observes the data. Uh, but anytime your work, you know, at all is used in a product or towards a product, it stops becoming just an observation observation, but it's something that is in influencing people and impacting what data will be gathered in the future. Um, and so this has definitely happened with YouTube where it's, you know, I think recommendation systems started out and still kind of have this idea of, oh, we're trying to pre predict what content users will like. But we're also determining what content users even see, you know, because there's so much content out there. And so it's kind of determining what gets shown to people and what has a chance of becoming popular. Um, Oh, another kind of really dark example from YouTube is basically the algorithm learned to get to put together these kind of playlists for uh, for pedophiles, where it would take uh, very innocent home videos people had uploaded that happened to have, you know, children in bathing suits or girls in leotards and kind of string them together in these playlists. Um, and this is, you know, not something that any person was doing, but the algorithm had learned, learned this and was showing it to people. Um, and often it had kind of escalating content that was getting kind of increasingly um, uh, sexual and inappropriate um, of children. And this happened both in France, and I think when people in France pointed it out, YouTube didn't really respond much. And then when the New York Times did a big article about it in the U.S., and then YouTube did respond um, and try to try to address it. Um, but you get yeah, kind of these very uh, very disturbing uh, patterns that the uh, the recommendation systems can learn. Another oh, I see a question. Uh, like a time. Is there a time window on choices of, you know, that are kind of being dictated by this algorithm? So, for example, I noticed that YouTube recommendations I was getting with for topics that I was interested in like eight, ten months ago. So is there some sort of time relevance that these algorithms also take into account? Because if you just because you search something intensely for two, three months, it shouldn't be sort of showing you those recommendations for like eternity or anything, right? Like, oh, does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good question. And that is a concern people raise about algorithms too, of often, often we have more than one interest or we want to learn about new things and don't want to be kind of pigeonholed into, yeah, just because you were interested in this for two months, that's what we're going to show you forever. Oh. It's not actually sort of linear that you're doing micro element change. I mean, so they, I don't even know that advanced is the right framework in that, like, there are ways that, you know, like, you know, they, will be doing kind of, a, you know, reinforcement learning that's like at the cutting edge that they're publishing, but yeah, they can still then be missing things that seem clear to a person. I think, I think your point also, though, brings up this lack of, of user control of like, uh, you know, you don't have a mechanism for entering, you know, telling the, the system like, hey, I'm sick of this topic. Um, and so there is a question about, I think, user control and user values. Um, you know, you also don't have a mechanism of telling, um, uh, telling the algorithm like, hey, 
today I want to learn new things versus today I just want to watch funny videos or, you know, those sorts of different goals that you might have. Um, so in some ways it's quite coarse, but in other ways it can be doing things that are um, at least technically sophisticated. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's a good, good point. Um, another uh, another example of a feedback loop occurs in predictive policing, um, and the idea of predictive policing, which I think occurs more in the, the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, than Australia, yet is where uh, police use software to try to predict, you know, which neighborhoods should we send more police to. Um, the problem with that is if you have more police in a neighborhood, they're more likely to make more arrests and see more things going wrong, you know. The opposite if you don't send any police to a neighborhood a different neighborhood like they're not going to arrest anyone there because they're they're not there um, and then this can create a feedback loop because you're like oh we made more arrests in this neighborhood maybe we should send even more police here um, and so this uh, this is a problem uh, one researcher that works on this has said predictive policing is aptly named it is predicting future policing not future crime um, and so there's you know also a bit of an issue with a, a proxy of uh, you know considering uh, arrest as, as similar to crime, but you have a, a feedback loop that can, can go out of control. And then a, an example that I, I return to a lot, because um, I, I find this really haunting, um, this comes from the, the US and it's software that's used to determine uh, people's healthcare. And when it was implemented in Arkansas, there was a bug in the code that incorrectly cut care for people with cerebral palsy. Um, and so this uh, here, uh, this article interviewed Tammy Dobbs, who's pictured she has cerebral palsy and she needs a home health aide to help her get out of bed in the morning to get her breakfast for kind of very basic quality of life um, and life functioning. And she got this drastic cut in her care due to the software bug. And there was no way to appeal it. Um, and so it's just kind of like, well, this is what the algorithm said. And eventually it comes out through a court case, but this is really not, not ideal at all. Um, and I'll, I'll return to this example because to me it illustrates um, some risk that we really, really need to think about. Um, and then a, another kind of example of a similar phenomena from the UK was uh, this uh, software that was used in post offices that had bugs around accounting and something like 800 uh, post office employees were prosecuted because they were accused of embezzling money, but basically it was just the software bug showing errors um, in accounting. People did prison sentences over it. They lost their homes, their marriages. I mean, this had a really, really terrible, um, terrible effect. And it took, um, I mean, I think this started close to 15 or 20 years ago. It took quite a long time. Like the UK is coming out now and saying like, oh, this was wrong, but um, really, really destroyed people's lives. And so in both of these, I uh, point to this common issue of when you don't have a way to identify or address your mistakes. Um, they also kind of highlight that algorithms are often used differently than human decision makers. Um, people are more likely to assume algorithms are objective or error free. Um, so this is kind of a, a form of bias where we think, oh, if something's coming from a computer, it must be, it must be objective, it must be correct. Algorithms are more likely to be implemented with no appeals process in place, um, so no way of finding recourse. They're often used at scale and they're cheap. And all of these interplay, you know, part of this is if you're using an algorithm for cost cutting, adding a, a human appeals process is more expensive. Um, you know, and so uh, these kind of things are very, very interwoven. Um, here, I wanted to just highlight the work of Paul Henman, uh, Professor Paul Henman of UQ, uh, because he was uh, just really, really ahead of the curve on this. He's been looking at what happens when governments digitize for decades. Um, and one of his findings is that computerization does not result in the same organization by different means, but that it fundamentally changes what organizations do. And so when we think of automation, um, we shouldn't think of like, oh, we're just going to take this human process, replace it with a computer, and everything else is going to be the same, but rather all these other aspects of policy and kind of how, how things work in the org are typically going to change as well. And that's part of kind of what we were seeing with this, this previous, uh, uh, these previous examples where there was, you know, no, uh, no way to catch mistakes or taking out your appeals process. Um, and he, he covers robo debt as a, as a case study where they are, you know, in many ways, the 
the automated system was a smokescreen for a policy change. Like they made some very fundamental policy changes with robo debt and how um, how these debts were calculated and collected. But it was you know pushed as like oh we're using kind of software and efficiency, and then there are these policy changes that are, are not as talked about. Um, so just to kind of summarize, uh, so all of this is uh, me going through my answer of you know, yeah, humans make mistakes and are biased. Why, why am I so concerned about algorithms? Um, and that's because of feedback loops, because of the possibility to amplify and not just encode bias, uh, that they can be used at massive scale and cheaply. Uh, no way to identify mistakes in many cases. They can also, I didn't talk about this, they can be used to evade responsibility. Dana Boyd describes this as algorithmic systems extending bureaucracy. And through, so throughout history, uh, humans have used bureaucracy as a way to kind of pass the buck and avoid responsibility. And, and, and sometimes I think it's not even intentional. Sometimes it's just like, oh, we have this bureau complicated bureaucratic system, so it's somebody else's fault. Um, but often algorithmic systems are just adding yet another uh, kind of piece to that that you can point to of like, oh, it's not my fault. Um, and it, it, it's, not, it's not that I want to be focused on fault, but it's if nobody's responsible, you're not going to get good outcomes. Like there has to be a sense of kind of responsibility. Um, and so for here, I want to kind of emphasize that it's it's really crucial that the people most impacted by a system have avenues for participation and power. I mean, I think some of the kind of most concerning examples of what can go wrong um, occur when the people who are being impacted by uh, by an algorithm or by a software system don't don't have any power and don't have any way to kind of participate. Uh, to me, ethics issues really underscore why we need everyone involved with AI and why I actually want more people involved with AI, and that's because I'm kind of having a, a greater diversity of who's involved, having people from all domains, increased, um, increased participation for the humanities and social sciences, which give us really, really important and needed kind of lenses and expertise for approaching these problems. And I think everyone in society needs a level of AI literacy also to evaluate claims that people are making of, you know, can the system do what people are claiming it can do. Um, so kind of looking back, you know, we had this example of, you know, the algorithm cutting healthcare, and that's something where the the patients with cerebral palsy who lost access to healthcare, like they knew something was wrong right away, but they, uh, you know, didn't have a way to get their complaints heard. Um, Another example comes from Twitter. Uh, this is back in early 26, uh, no, early 2014. Um, so it was before Gamergate, before the 2016 election, kind of before a lot of the things that have happened since. Um, there was this campaign of trolls that impersonated Black women to try to get this hashtag trending uh, about canceling Father's Day. And a number of black women notif noticed, you know, like, hey, there are these fishy accounts and things seem really off about this. And they actually found the, uh, the message boards where the trolls had kind of uh, uh, planned, like, hey, this is what we're trying to do. And they flagged all these accounts. Um, and Twitter really did not respond much at the time. Um, and the, the black woman that discovered this, you know, identified kind of like, this is the playbook that these trolls used for this kind of fake, uh, fake, Twitter campaign and these impersonated accounts with, you know, where they've stolen other people's profile pictures to, to pretend to be people that they're not. Um, and yeah, they were not really listened to though, the, the, the women that identified it. Um, and then again, you know, the, the genocide in Myanmar, uh, kind of civil society, people on the ground in Myanmar saw this coming years in advance and were warning Facebook execs as early as 2013, 2014, 2015. Someone close to the close to the matter who, you know, lived and worked in Myanmar said, you know, Facebook has the potential to to be what the radio broadcast were in Rwanda um, in, in Myanmar. Um, and and they told this to Facebook execs in 2015 and Facebook still like by end of 2015, I think only had four content moderators that spoke Burmese, um, you know, so just really, really appalling kind of lack of action, um, even though other people could see could see this problem coming. Um, and so, so all this highlights, sorry, these are kind of some very, very dark examples, um, but these really highlight how often the people most impacted by a system have the least power 
They recognize the issue early, but they're not listened to. And they also often best understand the needed interventions and kind of know like this is what would really help us uh, to, to kind of address this issue. Um, and so this is this is something that we kind of uh, need to, to build into build into systems more. And I'll talk talk about this more in a moment. Uh, a kind of a positive example, on the other hand, comes from Tracy Chow, who was one of the first five employees at Quora. And she went on to be one of the first engineers at Pinterest as well. Um, and she talks about how the first feature she built at Quora was the block button. Um, and that was because she was personally being harassed on the site. She was also the only woman at the company. Um, and she saw, you know, like, we need a block button. And she says if she hadn't been there, they would not have built it probably till much later. But she was able to kind of prioritize that um, by, by being a part of the team. And so I think that's a, kind of an example of, uh, of the positive things that can happen with, uh, with a diverse team. So one of, uh, one of my favorite events of the last few years uh, was the Participatory Approaches to Machine Learning Workshop at ICML. ICML is kind of a huge um, academic machine learning conference in 2020. Um, and I loved the, the call for the workshop. They talked about how the designers of a machine learning system have far more power over the system than the individuals who are impacted. Um, and that too often kind of when we try to solve these problems, we focus on centralized solutions, which just give kind of increasing power to system designers and operators. Um, and they call for, for searching for more democratic, cooperative and participatory ML systems. And so I found this a, a, a really beautiful vision um, and I'm excited to see people working on this in the machine learning community of, of what will it look like for machine learning to be, to be more cooperative and participatory. Um, so on that, I always um, I always like to to give people you know something practical what you could do. I don't want this just to be a <laughs> talk where you leave and feel depressed of like oh that was pretty gloomy. Um, so here here are a few practices you can implement. Um, so I love uh, the Marcula Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University uh, has uh, some really really great researchers and great materials available online in their ethics and technology practice. And I particularly like their ethics toolkit. Um, and I'm just, they have seven tools. I'm just gonna mention two of them in the interest of time, but check this out. These are designed to be things that if you work at a company that you could implement in your company. Um, and so tool three, so I, should, I should mention tool one is kind of this idea around basically like red teaming of where you are proactively have people kind of looking for what could go wrong before it goes wrong and making that a process you do regularly and that you reward and kind of keep uh, uh, keep central. Uh, tool three is called expanding the ethical circle. And it's really about just thinking, you know, whose interests, desires, skills, experiences, and values have you possibly assumed rather than actually consulted? And really trying to kind of get more people and more viewpoints um, in there to, to look at uh, to look at your your product and the impact. Um, and I won't won't go through all of these, but recognizing kind of the stakeholders who are impacted by your product are much broader than just the uh, the customers that you know other people could be impacted. Like you can not even have a Facebook account and definitely be impacted by Facebook and how it how it influences the world. Um, and then a, a positive example I wanted to highlight uh, from UQ is uh, uh, Professor Janet Wiles has a, a project on uh, assisting people living with uh, dementia and a co part of a key part about it is co-design and kind of having people who live with or support those living with dementia um, co-designing the project and kind of a part of uh, creating what the project is. Another resource I want to share with you is uh, the Diverse Voices uh, Guide from the University of Washington Tech Policy Lab. And so this is both a, a academic research paper, but also kind of a how-to guide on how to hold expert panels with uh, viewpoints that you want to include that, uh, you know, are not, uh, are not represented at your company. And they give examples of kind of holding panels with people with disabilities, people who are formerly or currently incarcerated to get their, their feedback. Um, in this case, it's around kind of tech policy white papers, but this can work for other, other tech products as well. Um, it is it is really important that this sort of participatory work is is 
genuine and substantial and meaningful. Um, so we have seen examples uh, where it ends up just being uh, hollow and tokenistic. So uh, Sidewalk Labs is a alphabet kind of slash Google company. Um, and in Toronto, they held a consultation with Indigenous elders. It was this kind of like week, uh, several day thing. And the, uh, the Indigenous elders came up with 14 recommendations. And when Sidewalk Labs put together their 1500 page plan, they didn't even mention them. Yet they mentioned like, oh, we consulted with Indigenous elders. And so that's, you know, that's really terrible like clearly they didn't care about the recommendations um, so that's not the not the goal and so uh, definitely be on the lookout for participation washing kind of just the same way we have greenwashing of you know companies claiming to care about sustainability but not uh, not truly um, so that can happen there's a great paper on this called participation participation is not a design fix for machine learning and this is not saying to not have participation but to make sure that you're doing it in a in a genuine way. So that was a, that was one of the tools. Um, another tool is closing the loop, uh, really making sure that you have channels for feedback. And so that was that one of those problems we saw earlier, where you know mistakes were happening and people could even see the mistakes, and they didn't have any way to kind of elevate those concerns to someone who could address them. Um, and so this kind of gives uh, some guidelines of making sure that you have a way to actually get ethical feedback, so that you can incorporate that and kind of improve improve what you're doing. Uh, a concrete example of this uh, comes from Alex Fierce, who is previously the chief legal officer of Medium. Um, and so he talks about the separation of uh, product people and trust people. And so, and I, I'm actually still kind of getting up to speed on Australian uh, startups and tech companies. Um, in the US, typically, uh, product design and engineering will kind of be in like, you know, one group and then totally separate will be trust and safety and trust and safety includes like content moderation, uh, whoever is handling user complaints, often legal, um, but kind of people who are on the front lines of hearing like what's going wrong, like what are the customer complaints, like what's the, the terrible, um, what are the, yeah, what are the things that are breaking and that is totally separate from kind of product engineering and design, which are really like driving, uh, driving what's built. And this is a real problem. And Alex uh, interviews someone who says the separation of product people and trust people worries me uh, because in a world where product managers and engineers and visionaries cared about this stuff, it would be baked into how things get built. Um, you know, and if it stays this way, the big stuff is not going to change. Uh, so I thought that was kind of a good practical suggestion of just having more integration between uh, between those groups. Um, I do, I do want to note uh, as well that uh, technology is not going to solve all of this. Um, and I sometimes have students, you know, that are like, oh, you know, just give me the algorithm that will debias my data set. I want to run that and, you know, check, I'm done. Uh, but many, many of the problems that uh, we've talked about tonight really um, get into human rights concerns and civil rights concerns when we're talking about people's access to uh, medical care, to housing. Um, and so we need to need to consider uh, policy, uh, kind of returning to this example of, of Facebook's role in Myanmar. Um, you know, yeah, people have said like this is not 2020 hindsight. The scale of the problem was significant, um, and it was already apparent. And as I mentioned in 2015, uh, Facebook only had four content moderators that spoke uh, spoke Burmese. Um, in contrast, okay, oh, actually first, uh, so then after, you know, after they reach full-blown genocide and there's a congressional hearing, I think this is like 2018, you know, finally Zuckerberg says, oh, I'm going to hire dozens more people. Um, in contrast, uh, Germany passed a hate speech law where Facebook would have faced a penalty of, uh, I think, up to 50 million euros. And Facebook hired 1,200 people in under a year uh, because they were trying to avoid this penalty of, of 50 million euros. And so, to me, this is just such a contrast. And I'm, I, you know, I'm not saying like, oh, we should have this uh, uh, same law that Germany did, but just the way that the threat of a significant financial penalty motivated Facebook to act in a much swifter way and at a much greater scale than years of saying you could be contributing to genocide did. Um, and so I think this shows kind of one thing that, that companies respond to. Um, and we're, what?
is, yeah, it isn't Facebook's responsibility to stop people being dicks to one another. Oh. And really what you're seeing there is... I think it's very diminutive to refer to a genocide as people being dicks to each other. I mean, this is, we're talking about like mass murder, mass rape. Like that's not... Um, that's not... It is not Facebook's responsibility to stop people doing evil to one another. So now that we've, we've, we've um, now that we're not playing semantics, um, we can get to the to the crux of the crux of the point that I'm trying to make. I mean, I would, I would just I, I welcome a response. <laughs> the the UN um, again, the UN ruled that Facebook had played a determining role in the genocide. It's not it's not incidental. This is kind of a well respected body saying this was a determining role of. Because it, was, it was, because it was used to incite violence, it was used to um, spread dehumanizing hate speech at scale. Um, and a lot of, um, you know, comparing people to, to insects and kind of, uh, and these are patterns that are seen. You know, it's really, it's important to recognize genocide as, uh, you know, it's typically, it's not something that happens overnight, even if violence breaks out suddenly, but that there are kind of years of patterns leading up to it. I, I think though that, I mean, I think most people, you know, I don't think people that work at Facebook are evil. Like, I mean, I think mo most people, I think, don't want to contribute to a genocide. You know, like most people don't want to uh, to play a role in this. Uh, but I think it is. I think it's very important for us to kind of reflect on uh, what are our human values and how can we contribute to a um, uh, contribute to a world that reflects those values. Um, and so I would say that to uh, yeah, I would not uh, uh, dismiss away of, yeah, that it's uh, somehow unimportant uh, to, to contribute to or towards a genocide or to not, if people are warning you that that's what happening, what's happening to, to not take action about it. And there's, I mean, there's a whole history, I haven't gone into this, um, that, you know, going back to, you know, philosophy goes back thousands of years, like humans and kind of our cultures have always kind of looked at these questions of what's right and wrong, you know, and through, through different lenses. And um, you can see this, I mean, both in um, Western philosophy, also in various indigenous and first nations value systems of people kind of uh, determining kind of like what are their values and what do we want to promote as a society? Um, I'm going to continue, um, continue for now. Uh, I wanted, I wanted to highlight that, uh, uh, we need both policy and ethical industry behavior. Um, and sometimes people kind of may go overboard emphasizing individual behavior or go overboard emphasizing policy, but that both, uh, both are crucial. Um, and that policy is the tool that we use for addressing negative externalities uh, from misaligned economic incentives, race to the bottom situations, enforcing accountability. Um, so those are, those are kind of things where, you know, there's a whole, kind of, you know, economics has looked at this uh, for a long time of how do we, how do we deal with negative externalities. Um, however, we also need ethical behavior in industry. Um, the law will not always keep up. There will be edge cases. Um, and so it's really, it's really crucial to have both. And so kind of wherever you're situated, kind of whether you work at a tech company or if you work in government or nonprofit or if you're a student, um, I think it is important to be thinking about these and that you do have a role, a uh, role that you can play because we need to approach these problems from, from different angles. Um, so just uh, just in summary, uh, some some baby steps towards solutions. Uh, ways to surface errors quickly is I think crucial for for any system that is impacting people's lives. Uh, there is a. a I didn't talk about this uh, today. Content moderation is kind of a whole another huge topic, uh, but there's something called the Santa Clara principles that a group of ethicists came up with around content moderation and tech platforms don't actually follow them. Uh, but one thing they call for is timely and meaningful appeals. And I really like that language of timely and meaningful to have people uh, really have a way to appeal for systems that are, that are impacting them. Oh, and I've got it here on the slide. <laughs> uh, I had forgotten that was the next, uh, next bullet. Um, meaningful con consultation with voices that are often overlooked. And it's, you know, those voices are there and they're speaking and it's just about uh, having the right people listening to them and, uh, and taking them in and kind of building the mechanisms for that to happen. I think diversity in hiring, retention and promotions can, can play a role in this. 
um, designing products, processes, and tech with contestability in mind. And I, I didn't get into this uh, today, but there, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of talk about explainability and interpretability, and I think those are important concepts, um, but even more so the ideas of recourse and contestability. And that's, you know, uh, so Burke Uston has work on this where he talks about, you know, often, you know, people might ask, like, oh, why did this algorithm deny my loan? And really what they want to know is, you know, they're asking why for the explanation, but really what they want to know is what could I change to get a loan? You know, like they, they want to, actionable recourse and action they can change take to change their outcome. And so to think more about kind of what is re what recourse do people have and how can we know that people will contest our systems and have that be a part of the systems themselves and not, and not an afterthought. Um, closer integration of product engineering with trust and safety. And here trust and safety includes anybody that's getting your user complaints, um, your, your content moderation, kind of seeing, uh, seeing the abuse or dark side that's happening, um, and then supporting, supporting good policy. Um, so these are, yeah, kind of, and these are, you know, the problems I've talked about tonight are, they're complicated, uh, complex problems. Um, but these are kind of, yeah, baby steps towards, towards solutions. Um, and then finally, I just want to say again that I think to me, ethics really underscores why we need everyone involved with AI kind of from, from all different backgrounds, because these are, are such important issues. And actually, I, I, well, I was going to end on this slide. I have one more slide, I, a quote I love um, that I'll share. This is from Deborah Raji, who's an AI researcher. Uh, Data are not bricks to be stacked, oil to be drilled gold to be mined, opportunities to be harvested. Data are humans to be seen, maybe loved, hopefully taken care of. Um, Deborah Raji, and she's written a number of excellent AI uh, papers, so definitely check out her work, and she's currently a PhD student at UC Berkeley. Um, but thank you. All right, thank you, Rachel. We will start some Q&A, so if you have questions, please put your hand up. The first question we're going to take from one of our online audience, Conrad. His question is, do you think that the simple labelling of a model as machine learning raises red flags about bias that otherwise wouldn't be? Specific example, no one really cares about classical actuarial modelling that leads to insurance companies charging higher car, car insurance premiums for young male drivers because they're a higher risk group. Does labeling something as a machine learning model mean that we're now not okay with it? Um, yeah, I, th I think that in some cases it does. Yeah, I think because bias in machine learning. Well, and, and it's also to me, uh, you know, to me the greater issue is is the bias itself, not the the type of algorithm. So another example we saw is uh, uh, at Stanford when they started rolling out the COVID vaccines. They used uh, they used this algorithm that turned out to be like this very simple rule based approach. And basically, though, they vaccinated these kind of like administrators that were like working from home before they vaccinated like frontline residents who were in the ER seeing COVID patients. And so there was like a huge, huge outcry about this, you know, because I mean, that was a terrible decision. Um, and initially it was released as like the algorithm, you know, said to do this. And then there was all this debate about like, oh, but this was like too simple to really be an algorithm um, that ended up kind of people debating the, <laughs> the question of like, should we call this an algorithm or not? Whereas like the, the bigger issue was, you know, like, okay, they vaccinated people that were working from home before they vaccinated kind of people who were at the like lowest career level treating COVID patients. Um, and so to me, like bringing it back to like, who are the humans being harmed is the, the most important question. But yes, sometimes people do fixate on, have we called this machine learning? Have we called it an algorithm? Is it complex or something? A bit following from that, is it not important to unpack that because if it's just, let's say, a standard algorithm like we tradition had in computer science for over 50 years, then it's the human decision making. Well, if it's maybe a machine algorithm, it may be something else, or if it's like companies wanting to save costs and therefore don't offer any alternative interest. So if we unpack the problem a bit more, we can probably maybe like the solutions will probably be very diverse and multidimensional. Yes, and I, I, I agree that you, you do need to know, yeah, like what is the nature of this algorithm to to talk about solutions, yeah, and that, yeah, what you get from a, a machine learning model that is learned from patterns of data versus a rule-based model is going to be different, um, yeah, and require different solutions. 
I mean, I, I guess I will say, uh, uh, like, I guess one benefit of the, or not benefit, but like with the rule-based model, it is often clear of like, if there's discriminatory behavior, you can kind of identify it very quickly of like, oh, okay, the, the rule was saying to do this, like it's clear why we got this outcome. Uh, whereas with machine learning, sometimes it's, uh, the underlying dynamic can be like more complex of identifying like, wait, why is it doing this? Uh, firstly, thank you so much. It's been so informative and really helpful and um, great to listen to you this evening. Um, you. Secondly, um, just a quick one. What are your thoughts on the Facebook oversight boards? Do you think it's a step in the right direction? Do you think it's a toothless tiger? Any sort of thoughts or do you think it's just too early to make a call in it at this stage? Um, I mean, so my, my understanding is that the Facebook oversight board doesn't really have power to to veto things and you know and it's also they've been given kind of a very limited framework of you know of uh, whether or not they're is it whether or not they're overruling or maintaining these kind of particular type of decisions so it's just a very limited scope that's not truly empowered um uh yeah so that would yeah i guess be, be my answer on that um and that and that facebook in general has i think an uncomfortably large amount of power Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks. I second that. That was a really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about from a policy point of view, do you think there are any areas of AI that should be legislated against being used um, ethically? So, for example, autonomous weapons spring to mind. Yes, this is this is a big question. Um, yeah, there's like a, an area that I am very concerned about is um, using facial recognition to identify protesters. Um, and so we've had kind of several cases in the US where police have used facial recognition to identify black people that are protesting police violence against black people, which is this, uh, 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 I just think kind of terrible use. And so that that's something that worries me. So yes, I do think that there will be, um, and that, I mean, there already are areas where we, we should, not, uh, should not use AI. Do they use it badly because they're getting the wrong results? Or is, it, is there another reason why it's bad? No, it's, it's bad even if it works. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's been this, and I actually had a few slides that I cut on this. So yeah, so facial recognition has higher error rates on people with dark skin. It also has higher error rates on women compared to men. So women with dark skin is the worst. But even, um, no, even if you fix that, so it's totally accurate, I think that's a bad use. Um, so there's uh, this issue around surveillance in which, um, kind of throughout history and even predating computers, surveillance is used by people with more power against people with less power. And it is used um, often to stop social change. And um, so for instance, in the US, uh, you know, the FBI surveilled Martin Luther King Jr., who was a black man that led um, uh, our civil rights movement. Um, it also surveilled Cesar Chavez, a Latino man who led a, a, a movement of farm workers for, for fair treatment. Um, and so the, and this wasn't, you know, like this wasn't using uh, facial recognition or AI. This was decades ago. Uh, but we kind of have this pattern of how how surveillance is used. And so I have yeah, a lot of concerns about surveillance technology, which is not just facial recognition. It's also, you know, uh, gate recognition, voice identification, there are kind of all sorts of biometric markers. Um, and so it's not like, it's not a coincidence, like, oh, police just happened to use this to protest or, you know, to identify protesters, but it's, you no, know, this is kind of the pattern of history of how these technologies are used. They are not used to, to kind of hold the powerful accountable. Um, but that's a, a good question, because yeah, like the, the issue of bias and facial recognition has gotten a lot of attention. Um, I just wanted to go back to the example of the use uh, for actuarial purposes. So is there an opportunity where there, the, the negatives can be turned into a positive? Because that's a fairly straightforward commercial um, scenario with insurance where the, the purpose of actuarial is to, to kind of manage and control the risk versus the reward, i.e., you know, policy income versus claims made. So... Um, if you identify that there is specifically an area where there's an issue, i.e. young male drivers, et cetera, um, can that be turned into a positive where it should be? And, and how can ethics um, around 
AI, the processes actually turn that into a positive. So identify that as potentially a, a business opportunity or a new stream or, or a way of engaging or uh, retaining customers, that type of thing. So it's using the, the data and then looking at it from not just the negative, but what are the positives? Uh, are, are you saying kind of how uh, how the data or how machine learning can, sorry, so, yeah. so, the, so like the positive with actual, you're saying the positive with actuarial is that it's used to manage risk. Yeah. Well, the motive oh, of actuarial yeah, at the, the motive, moment is yeah. to minimize risk <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, uh, and, and, and manage the process of claims. I, um, you don't write the business, so you reduce your business, um, you just don't write a risk at all. I you refuse the insurance, you make it so expensive, it's not appealing. Um, so if that's the case, what can, what kind of tools can be embedded to say, okay, well, yeah, this is happening across so many different um, streams, channels, whatever, and then turn that into something that then could be a potential business opportunity. Like how do you want to attract and retain those, those potential customers that you're actually rejecting? Can you educate them? Can you I offer mean, uh, different like, services? Like AI is definitely, uh, it is, it's very efficient at optimizing metrics. And so, yeah, kind of any set of metrics that you give it, it's, it's also excellent at learning patterns in your data. Um, so, it, so much of it depends on the context. Um, yeah. And so if you are- and the motive. Yes, um, and the motive. And it, you know, and it's important to recognize, like I don't, I don't believe that tools are neutral. Like there are these kind of patterns to how, how tools are used and how they kind of um, fit into to, to structures. Um, but it can, uh, you know, and like I uh, at the beginning talked about, you know, applications that I see as positive. I have, you know, like identifying these, you know, tumor variants and, and genome mm -hmm. sequencing. Um, and so uh, a lot of it does come down to kind of how a, a problem is framed. Um, and so I think, you know, I think there are uh, <laughs> risk with optimizing metrics uh, too much. Uh, I have a paper on this on kind of the, the problem with metrics. Um, but to a point, you know, in like in the appropriate context, yeah, being able to optimize a metric uh, can have, you know, positive effects is I think what you're saying. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, ethics and bias, um, they sort of appeal to people in all sorts of ways. We all don't want to be biased, but if I go and implement a machine learning system, I will inevitably put some bias into it. If I have a more diverse set of people uh, helping me, the bias may not be personal, but it will reflect the bias of the group. Um, I think we've, we've got to be honest and look at that. Um, one of the things I was thinking of was when you talk about the cerebral palsy person. We, we all hate to think that denying um, health care to that person um, is a, if we think of it as a bad thing, you know, but if that healthcare was applied in a different way that helped a greater group of people, um, it, you know, it comes back to the dilemma. Are you going to try to switch where you kill one person or you kill five people? Um, there's, 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 yeah, so there, I have two things to say about this. Um, so one is, um, so the second part of your, your statement is kind of getting towards these, um, what should be policy decisions. And so if you do want to have this policy change in how you allocate health care, that should be discussed as a, a policy change. Um, and kind of part of the, the problem uh, with automation, you know, is that it can be the smokescreen for policy change. Um, but it needs to be more clear. And we're kind of seeing this right now with NDIS in Australia, where, you know, there's this proposal to change to this automated system that was initially just like, oh, this is going to be more efficient. This is going to be more equitable. And then it comes out like, oh, no, this is about saving. I can't remember if it's like billions of dollars. And it's like, that needs to be front and center. Like, no, we're trying to cut billions of dollars from this program and then get into like, okay, this is how we're going to automate or allocate that. But to keep the, keep the question of, and I, and I think the question of 
should we be cutting billions of dollars to this program should be front and center um, and not this kind of like afterthought that sneaked in. And then and that's partly, um, you know, in this case with the, the, the bug, like I don't, um, you know, it wasn't particularly that they were trying to cut care to people with cerebral palsy, but there was, I think, these cost-cutting motives. Um, but I think it's those should be debates that we're having. And, and this is, a, we're often seeing that uh, AI or algorithmic systems are kind of used as about, like, let's not allocate um, very much money towards this social service, and then let, like, let's use AI to try to, you know, more efficiently divide up how we're, how we're allocating. Um, and so I think it's good to kind of keep though, like if the question is about how much we're allocating, like that should be the central debate. Um, so that's uh, that was about kind of the second part of what you said. Um, the, the first part I did wanna highlight, um, this is about, uh, you were talking about teams, um, but you, you brought up a good point about how uh, there's always bias, like we're not bias free. Um, and so I want to share this about data sets that I think some of the most promising work on data sets has been um, work like Timnit Gebru's data sheets for data sets. Um, there's also a kind of NLP statements, there's uh, data set nutrition labels, kind of a number of, of academic papers that basically say like you're not going to have a, a bias free data set. And the crucial thing is to record all the context about how your data set was gathered, what was included, what was left out. And by doing that and kind of knowing the context of like, this is who created it, what they chose to include or not include, um, at least you're not going to be blindsided by the biases because yeah, you're not going to get rid of the biases, but the problem now is we're often not even aware of them. And so just to kind of even be more explicit of like, this is, this is what went into this and what didn't. Um, so that I think kind of gets towards what you were saying kind of in the first part of your question. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Um, so recently, YouTube has decided to ban all anti-vaccine uh, videos, and some people might criticize that, you know, it's a slippery slope, you know, towards censorship. So where do you see, how can these platforms balance between free speech and you're also stopping potentially dangerous information? And is it, should it be left to them to make this decision or should policy provide some sort of guardrails, you know, to provide them a framework of making that decision? And should these platforms be held responsible for content, you know, published on their, on their platform? And I mean, the US takes a more libertarian, you know, approach where, you know, these social media platforms are not held responsible for the content, whereas the EU seems to go the other way. And I'm curious where you stand on that spectrum. Yeah, so uh, this is, yeah, these are, these are tough questions. Um, I also want to distinguish between uh, a lot of people talk about free speech versus free reach um, and the distinction between content that YouTube posts versus what it actively promotes. Um, with its recommendation system. And so there is kind of a distinction there because in the past there's been, you know, super harmful content that was not just being hosted by YouTube, but it was being recommended like a billion times, you know, just kind of like really um, aggressively pushed at people that would not have otherwise seen it. Um, You're saying it's an influencer? Oh. No, but I, I'm talking about how YouTube treats the material, about whether, so although, although now it's kind of this issue of people can tell when they, you know, they feel like they've been shadow banned or, you know, like their material is not, uh, not being shared or not being, not showing up in, um, in YouTube in recommendations. Um, so I, I did want to just make this distinction though between kind of what is hosted versus what is what is recommended. Um, I do think that there needs to be uh, outside input and control. Like I don't think YouTube should just be making its decisions on its own because these decisions do have such a profound impact for, for society. And it is weird to have a private corporation 
um, kind of making making decisions about about what is shown. Um, but I don't have a, a clear like this is the five step policy that we we implement um, to to address this. Sorry, just going back a couple of steps. Um, healthcare is very close to home for me in the sector that I'm working in. Um, does that question around or comment around the cerebral palsy patient? Um, I can categorically state, say, state that we have enough resources. And so that mindset that we're looking at is more like scarcity. What are we taking away from someone to provide another? The reality is that we should be thinking more, how do we treat more people with a more efficient healthcare sector? So I think there is no need to consider anybody with cerebral palsy to be untreated, just like in America, anyone who, you know, loses two hat two arms in an accident has to choose between one or the other. Yeah, so, no, thank backtracking you. a bit. There, yeah, no, th thank you for saying that explicitly. Um, yes, I do agree with you. And I do think I think this is a pattern in kind of AI debates where they often start at a point of artificial scarce, scarcity and kind of uh, assuming a scarcity that is not uh, is not really the case. And then yeah, kind of allocating based on that. Just, I think that we might, uh, well, it's a really good discussion. I think in the interest of time, we might end it there as far as the, oh, and, oh sorry. Yeah, so thank you. Let me make two final plugs uh, as For we sure. wrap up. So one is I have started an AI ethics reading group uh, through the, the AI meetup and so, uh, yeah, definitely come out and join us for that if you're interested in reading papers on these topics and, and discussing some further because I, yeah, I can see that many of you have lots of lots of thoughts and insights on this. Um, also, I should have made a plug for this. Um, I taught a course on, on data ethics that covered a lot of these topics and all the videos for that are online uh, kind of free. So if you're interested, uh, I think it's ethics.fast.ai would take, take you to uh, take you to those videos. And I think just to tag on to that one, the, the course is practical data ethics, right? So yes. it's all about what can you actually do? You know, there's a lot of talk about ethics, a lot of articles, but if you actually want to learn about what you can do, some of the tools you can use as an engineer or a data scientist, there's definitely some great resources in there. Um, for anyone who does want to continue discussion, feel free to, you know, grab some more drinks and, and talk a little bit more. Rachel, just one question. When is the next reading group for AI ethics? And so the next reading group is Wednesday, October 27th at 545. Um, well, it's at the AI Hub, which is just uh, up a level or no, down a level. Uh, what? In this building. <laughs> Um, in this building, uh, you can yeah you can find uh, find the sign up on the meetup page, and I'll also I'll be sending that out in the next few days um, if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, but yeah, consider joining us. We'll be reading. Um, everyone wants to do the modeling work. Nobody wants to do the data work, uh, which is a excellent I think excellent name for for a paper, and it's a great paper. Um, so and you can you can find the the link uh, link of where to find it um, on the on the meetup page. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you, everybody.